Up next, we have another speaker, Mr. Salman Kamajan. Um, Salman Kamajan is a nationally renowned public speaker, the author of five books, independent journalist, community activist, and youth basketball and soccer coach. Solomon has delivered lectures on Africana studies and the history of hip hop culture throughout the United States and in places like Norway. Here on campus, Solomon is the assistant director of Nimburu and an adjunct faculty member within the Department of African American Studies. Solomon also teaches a weekly workshop in Nimburu on black history and social justice movements. He has a strong passion for history and finding ways to give back to historically ne neglected communities. Let's give a hand clap to Mr. Solomon Kamala. All right. I know Dr. Ziegler already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, if you speak Kiswahili, Habariza Gioni. Sharon. Habari <laughs> Zagioni. Um, it's, it's an honor. It is an absolute honor to be before you today. All right? Because you guys could have been anywhere in the world, as I said, but you chose to be right here, right now, at this time. And this room could be overflowing, but the information that we're gaining, including myself, we're sharing information. Um, we're sharing soul and inspiration. We've got to take this information, this inspiration as well. We have to take it out of these doorways after we feed ourselves and nourish our bodies and take it, take it into your dormitories, your houses, uh, anywhere you occupy, your, your places of, of employment and share that information. Do not keep it to yourself. So in that, I want to start off with a quote by the great Honorable Marcus Masai Garvey. How many people know who Marcus Garvey was? Good, good. The founder of the UNIA, Universal Improvement uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association. And I think this is a perfect quote to get things kicked off. He said, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. We're not going to be trees without roots. We're going to embrace our history. Um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson is the founder of Black History Month. But when he was alive, it was not called Black History Month. He called it Negro History Week and it was founded in 1926, 1926. By the time he had passed on in 1976, it became Black History Month. And so this was nothing that white America gave to us. This is something that was created by one of our ancestors, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson, who also happened to be the second African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University. He taught right down the road at, um, at um, Howard University, born into slavery, um, a tremendous story. But it's important for us to know that he created Negro History Week, not just to focus on that one week, not just to focus on that one week, but he mentioned oftentimes that it should be a point of departure, a, a, a trampoline for us to use it as a trampoline to explore African history, black history, throughout the entire year. And anywhere people of African ancestry, anywhere in this world where they, where they occupy. So not just focusing on the achievements of African Americans, but also achieve, focusing on the achievements of people of African ancestry throughout the Caribbean, continental Africa, the UK, anywhere people of African ancestry are. All right, so do not let this be the last day that you explore your history. And quite frankly, if you are a human being in this room, you have African history running through you because the origins of humanity started in Africa. Yes, you the top for your history, the world history. I want to, the kind of thing, the theme of, of my brief talk, and it's only going to be about 10 minutes or so, so uh, please indulge me uh, just a little bit is to reclaim your history. Because if you don't reclaim your history, somebody else will. Somebody else will. If you're like me, I'm originally from Trinidad. But when I came to the United States at the age of nine, 10 years of age, um, it, was, it was really 
interesting to me because I, I you know, in Trinidad, we, we grew up knowing that Christopher Columbus was a very, very bad man, <laughs> that he committed genocide on the care of people that, that are the original proprietors, the original um, people who, who occupied the land of, of Trinidad. And so when I came to the United States, it was, it was very weird because to see that somebody like Christopher Columbus was being celebrated, a federal holiday, for somebody who was a mass murderer or a serial rapist, um, never stepped foot in, in North America, but did some very, very nefarious things. And anything that is new to you, that you, you're hearing for the first time, please jot it down. Jot it down. Christopher Columbus was all these things. He did things that may, would have made Hitler blush. But the reason I say this is because when you don't know your history or history in general, and he also he happened to be a very, after he killed off all those indigenous people throughout the Caribbean and Central America and parts of South America, he was one of the biggest cheerleaders for the African slave trade to let's bring in some of those African people, those black people, our ancestors, bring them in to the so-called new world, all right, so they can be worked like dogs until they die and we just keep funneling them in. But if you don't know history, your history or history in general, anybody can sell you something. Anybody can sell you something and the next thing you know, you are celebrating somebody who if you were put in a hot tub time machine and put all the way back to 1492, this per individual would have enslaved you or done much, much worse. It makes no sense whatsoever. And the same thing goes with people that we've grown up referring to as our founding fathers. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, they were all devout slave owners. And before you say, oh, they didn't know any better, yes, they did, because there were individuals like Thomas Paine who would remind them that how hypocritical it is that we talk about life, liberty, and the f pursuit of happiness, yet we hold these African people, these black bodies in bondage and work them to death. But they said, no, they're not even human beings, so what? And that's why it was written in the original Constitution, three-fifths of a human being. And so they justified it over and over again. So you should never refer to them as a, refer to them as a founding father, unless you think your, your father or your mother or your uncle would put you into slavery in that manner. African history, however, did not begin with shadow slavery, not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. The origins of scholarship, the origins of mathematics, the origins of sciences, Metallurgy, the smelting of iron ore, architecture, medicine, started in Africa. Started in Africa where your ancestors came from. It is important to understand this because I say this again to point out that if you don't know your history, people can reshape it. If you, any people in here um, have aspirations of going on to become a doctor, an MD of some sorts, okay. All right. Well, the world's first doctor is known as somebody by the name of Imhotep. Imhotep. The interesting thing about Imhotep, because the conquerors have reshaped and wrangled history in such a manner, and this is a note, this, this is very important to note. Very important. I see my sister Aisha watching. Aisha over there nodding her head. She knows very well. So, Imhotep lived 2,000, 2000, probably 2,200 years before an individual by the name of Hippocrates. And when Hippocrates was alive, there was no notion of, of, of race. You didn't go walk around referring to yourself as a white man or a black man. You referred to yourself as a Greek, uh, or, uh, or should, I should say an Athenian, or a Roman, or an Ashanti, a Mindy, Igbo, Yoruba. That's how you referred to yourself. So he never had the temerity they didn't to, to say, oh, I'm you know, better, of these, better than these people because I'm white and they're black. And the interesting thing is, Hippocrates, when you become a doctor, those of you that raised your hand, when you become a doctor, you're asked to give something called the Hippocratic Oath. And you raise your hand and you give this Hippocratic, and that is your entrance, your entree into the world of medicine. Giving honor and praise to what people in the Western world call the father of medicine. But what's interesting is Imhotep lived 2,000 plus years before Hippocrates did. What's interesting is Hippocrates, in his own words, don't take my word for it, in his own words, Hippocrates says, I am a child of Imhotep. He said, I am a child of Imhotep. Talking about the research that he did, that he based much of his 
medical expertise on was based on the information that he had gotten from this black man from Africa. But yet, it is not called the Imhotepin oath or the Imhotep oath. It's called the Hippocratic oath that you take. Because how dare we give credit and have all these doctors all throughout the world praise a black man and give oath to a black man as they become doctors. As I quickly moved down, the world's first universities came out of Africa, such as Luxor, Luxor Karnak, they called them mystery schools. The University of Sankor in Timbuktu, in present day Mali, where white people came from southern Europe and came and studied from black professors. Yes, this happened. This is world history. We came before Columbus, before Columbus came over here and, and brought his carnage. Hundreds of years before that, black Africans from the west coast of Africa, primarily from Mali, led by Abu, Abu Bakari II, in relation to Mansa Musa, took ships and brought ships over to the so-called New World. But guess what? They didn't bring, they, they, they weren't coming to, to create carnage. They, one ship had gold trinkets and all these different things because they expected to meet people where they were going and expected to trade. And that's exactly what they did when they encountered the, the Omex. They, they traded for botany and spears. And so when Columbus came there hundreds of years later and saw these huge statues of these very African lips and noses, and then the, when they translated, they, they found out that these were built. They said, we, oh, we built these in honor of these um, tall, black-skinned, woolly-haired visitors from the East. This is world history. Hundreds of years before Columbus, we made that journey. And not as conquerors or killers or serial rapists. Alexander Pushkin, he is known as Russia's version of Shakespeare. He was a black man with ancestry from East Africa. Alexander Pushkin. The importance, and I am almost done, the importance, and this is just a quick journey. We're taking something called, you know, it may not be a hot tub time machine, but we're taking our own little time machine and we're just taking little stops here and there throughout history. And I, my hope is that anything, any nugget of information that I've given you continues to inspire you to take that information and to delve into your own research and to take it to new heights and to share it with others. So as I begin to close, the importance of slave revolts. When I was in school here in the United States growing up, it was always depicted as, okay, slavery was never, number one, depicted as anything harsh and heinous, but also the depictions of, of, of enslaved Africans. It was always as if they were happy-go-lucky, whether they were from Miss Carlsville State of Georgia and they were picking indigo and cotton, you know that, for 14 hours a day. Think about the hottest day in any summer that you've experienced. And think about your ancestors in Georgia or Louisiana or anywhere throughout the South and having to work in those conditions for 12 to 14 hours a day with very little water being whipped and being beaten and, and, and working and working until they died. All right. So the depiction often was the Sambo, the step and fetch, this happy-go-lucky Negro who is not even full human being, just sloughing here and there. Um, and, and, and just kind of happy. And they, were, and they were told that work hard now, and then when you die and go to heaven, then that's when you will be rewarded for working for us, the white men. But what's interesting, they don't tell you about all of the different slave revolts and insurrections, such as the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina. Or you look to Haiti, the great Haitian Revolution that, uh, that was completed in 1804 uh, and creating the first black republic that inspired African people throughout the world, especially here in North America. And Frederick Douglass talks about that. Or we look at the Republic of Palmares um, in, in, uh, um, in Brazil, where they created a connection of, of literally dozens of different towns and villages as they absconded and escaped from the Portuguese and created their own, uh, their, their own cities and, and communities. So it's important. Drapetomonia is a term that was created by a white psychiatrist called um, Samuel Cartwright. And 
They thought that they had beat us out. And, th and this is so important. Within you are such strong strains of resistance. When we talk about Second Lieutenant Richard Collins, and you see the beautiful performances here, and all the stuff that students did last, semest um, last semester, and also after, immediately after Richard Collins was tragically, viciously murdered, that, that is the resistance of your African ancestors running through you, mourning for one of your own, and saying, we are not going to go quietly in any shape, form, or fashion. But this quack, this charlatan, Samuel Cartwright, came up with a term called jadeemonia because they thought that they had beaten it, it, beat it out of us so hard that, that why would, why would a Ms. Car why would a Ann Carswell, why would a Ronald Ziegler, why would a Sharon, why would a Solomon, why would they escape from, from our plantation? To in slavery, the most natural thing it is to do is to try to find a way to escape. But they thought, they thought that that was a mental condition, that they would, that why would these Africans, why would these, why would these inwards, why would they try to escape? Why would they try to escape? So he came up with a term, and he went from plantation to plantation, he said, you know what? Once you catch them, if you catch them, bring them back to the plantation and cut off their big toes. Number one, it will prevent them from running because you cannot run very fast without your big toe. Number two, it will serve as a deterrent to all the different slaves. So resistance. So that is why resistance is so very important. And it's not, and the most important, the most powerful form of resistance is the mental, the psychological resistance. To say, I reject these, these notions that you put out there, these narratives that you put out there. I reject them all. I am proud of who I am. I am black. I am proud. I am African. I am proud. The importance, I cannot finish this without giving, telling you the importance of black women, of African women throughout history. Every single social movement or revolutionary movement has had women who have played a critical role, whether it was the black women who helped Dr. King and Malcolm X get to where they needed to get. They worked behind the scenes of SCLC that continue to do so and have done historically, or you want to go all the way back to Queen Nsinga, or you want to talk about the, the women from Dahomey that were in Haiti that, that played a critical role, not just organizing, but also fighting, but, out, but fighting the French, physically fighting the French. Black women have played a critical role. So look around yourselves, women. You are the founders. You are the backbone, the foundation of civilization and humanity you, and society without a doubt, without a doubt. And remember Harriet Tubman, she said, I freed a thousand slaves and I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. When you come across somebody who is mentally enslaved, you wake them up and you break those chains. You break them, break them very, very hard and free them of those mental shackles so that they realize who they are and where they occupy. And as we close, the prosperous black communities prior to the red summer of 1919, we're talking about places like Wilmington, North Carolina, we're talking about Rosewood in Florida, we're talking about Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, otherwise known as the Black Wall Street, prosperous black communities, so prosperous that they made those white communities around them, the white communities that created the situation in the first place, with the audacity, how ironic is it? You created the Jim Crow and the segregation, you didn't want us to mix, and so what we did is we organized like black people do, like Africans do, and we created something better than what you had. And because of that, during the red summer of 1919, jealous white folks came into those communities, those communities that their harsh laws and the Jim Crow created, and they massacred, and they destroyed those communities. But remember what we built, because it is very soon, right now, as in yesterday, that we need to rebuild those communities. We need to support black businesses, that's what I love about Ms. Carswell. I mean, she'll take a, a trip all the way to Upper Marlboro during Kwanzaa and go someplace and spend money just knowing that she's going there to support black businesses. So as I close, I want you to remember a, a, a term called, something called Ubuntu. And it is a Zulu term coming out of Southern Africa, specifically South Africa. The original name for South Africa is Azania, and we know these borders are Nigerian brothers and sisters, and wherever you are from the continent, understand all these borders were created in 1884 and 1885. They were created by Europeans, um, and these names were created. Nigeria is, was a name created by the British, just like Cameroon means large shrimp um, in Portuguese. 
That, the, that's exactly what it means. It means large shrimp, large prawns. Um, and so it, it's, it's very important that we understand that this term Ubuntu, coming out of Azania, coming out of present-day South Africa, if you will, it means I am because you are. I don't succeed without your success. And if you cut up in your downfall, it also, in some shape, form, or fashion, like the butterfly effect, it impacts me in some shape, form, or fashion. So we must look around, and that is why I started off by saying that we must take this information far outside the reaches of this sanctuary for African culture and history, otherwise known as Nibiru, and spread this information long, 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 long. And, 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 and in the essence of Ubuntu, I am because you are. Make sure that everybody is because you are, knows this information because you know it. And I will end on it with a quote. I started the quote with, a, with an ancestor, and I will end on a quote from an ancestor. Because even our historical figures, such as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, he has been repackaged as if he was this little cute, cuddly, black Santa Claus. And as sharp a man as he was, and he was taken far too soon at age 39, he was a stone cold revolutionary. He was an upright man. He was an upright man. And when he started to speak out against things, since we talk about the time of war, when he started to speak out against the Vietnam War, when he started to speak out against the abuse of workers, then, and, and when white workers started to be attracted to his words, he became a he persona non grata to the new United States government. He was targeted by the United States government. But he also was very, very proud of his skin. Very, very proud of his skin. So I end on this, this quote from him. This is Dr. Martin Luther King. And please, don't take anybody else's word on the history of Dr. Martin Luther King and other folks. They, there are books. Where do we go from here? From Community Chaos, a book that he wrote. Read their own words. Their own words, and then you will find out the truth. And then you will say, golly. There's been so much information about these individuals that have been, have, have been purposely obfuscated and, and marginalized and pushed off the margins. This is what he said at one point, a couple years before he was killed. Somebody told a lie one day. They couched it in language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionaries and see the synonyms of the word black. It's always something degrading and low and sinister. Look at the word white. It's always something pure, high, and clean. Well, I want to get the language right tonight. I want to get the language so right that everyone here will cry out, yes, I'm black, I'm proud of it. I'm black and I'm beautiful. You're all black and beautiful. God bless you. God bless Dr. Martin Luther King and all of our ancestors, Fane Hamer, Ella Baker, Otis Williams. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.